Amen. Boy, that is a true statement there. My Redeemer is faithful and true, and he didn't even know what I was preaching on tonight, but that's right straight down the line, what I'm going to talk about tonight. Psalm 27, in your Bible, Psalm 27, we'll read actually the entire psalm. It's 14 short verses as David works some things through his mind. I like the fact that uh, by inspired scripture, uh, David thinks out loud for the whole world to hear. And um, we're able to see his heart. And then because it's inspired scripture, we're able to understand what helps us, what can help us. And so I'm thankful. I love to read the Psalms. I love to read about David especially. And uh, this is a brand new microphone. Is it cracking up there? Are you all hearing the crack sound? Okay. Well, why don't you get me a microphone here if you wouldn't care. Just get me a microphone. And because uh, I don't think I can handle that tonight, let alone. Yeah, that's good right there. All right, good one, two. This is orange. Orange, there you go. All right, how many are you ready for Christmas? Uh, okay, how many got your Christmas tree up? All right. I stick my tongue out at you, but I'm not allowed to do that. We'll get ours up pretty soon. I'll tell you what, if it's normal around our house, it hasn't been for the past two weeks, but if it's normal, we'd have had ours up a long time ago. That's for sure. I know where it's at. How about that? But um, anyway, let's, let's uh, stand together, please, read them God's Word. Let's read this psalm together. I just feel like this is appropriate tonight. We're not in a series or anything, and I think this, this spoke to my heart earlier, and I believe it will you as well. And um, verse number one, Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host shall encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up, mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. Yea, I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. And I may not remember to say this, but when you get in, when you get in trouble, when, you, when you're having a low time, start singing. Pull up those old songs of Zion. Uh, sing in your soul. You'll be amazed at what it will do for you. Verse number 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me, and answer me. When thou saidst, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me, put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help, leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. He's just pouring his heart out here. When my father and my mother forsake me, then Lord will then then the Lord will take me up, teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. Verse thirteen. Let's read these two verses together. Verse thirteen. Ready? I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I want you to read verse, skip back and look at verse, verse 4. Let's read verse 4 together. We see the resiliency, uh, the commitment in King David when he says, let's read together verse 4. Ready? One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. That, uh, that phrase right there in verse 13, I had fainted. He said, just about fainted, just about gave up, just about quit, just about crawled in a hole where I didn't want to be around anybody and just give up this whole Christianity thing, God and all of it. But I didn't. And I want to show you why he didn't. 
And I want to show you how we cannot do that. Because I believe there's, there, are, there are people that struggle when they have hard times, they struggle. But uh, he, he did something early in his life, made a decision early in his life. When we started having trouble, he always gravitated back to this commitment. And tonight I want to give you just a brief formula for not fainting. If I was going to title this, I'd title this a formula for not fainting. And we're going to take it right out of the Bible. I will tell you that what I'm going to show you tonight has proven true in my life and my wife's life over and over and over and over again. And I want to help you with it. I don't know that I, I've done this in years here at this church, but I want to give you something I believe will help you tonight. Just very practical. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And when troubles come and the skies are dark with the clouds and the storms are rising, we know, we know that you'll be right there for us. Help us, Lord to stay steady and not faint. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. I was thinking about this passage earlier. I made some notes to, uh, to go back and take a look at it with the church. Uh, little did I know what was going to happen this week. This week, just a, a number of our folks have had some trials, deep, deep water trials, Sickness, death. A lot of people knew uh, Mr. Johnson. And just as we were having soul in the supper tonight, it was a shock to many as it started to riffle through from table to table. And um, it's going to affect a lot of people. We have nearly 30 kids down there, that, and all of them would know him. And then we've been watching, really, our vacation place, all of us, go up in flames how many of you have visited Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge Jerry, Hold your hand up. Most everybody. My wife and I love to go there. It's, ench it's an enchanting place to us. As soon as I pull off the interstate and start that drive into Sevierville, I, already just, I just start to relax. I love that place. There was a little cabin there that years ago when we first moved here. Uh, we used to sit out on the porch of that cabin. We'd go up there for, for a week, and we'd sit there and... and uh, and uh, Brother Duhart in a, in a swing, one of the old porch swings, and just, just listen to them chains just go back and forth. There's a little brook that came by there, and we listen to that brook bubble through there. And I'll tell you what, all the stress just rolls away for a while. Uh, that uh, cabin is gone. Uh, nearly 400 structures, most every cabin up the side of that mountain is burned to the ground. And one of the places we stay in uh, from time to time the last count I had, the, the flames were all around it, and the people were inside, and they kept them inside because they didn't know what really to do. They just beat the flames back. And I thought about all that. We came to the prayer room tonight, and we learned that there's seven people that already died, and there's a whole lot of areas they haven't even been able to get back into. And I, I'm not over there now. You can't even get in, but, you know, soon we'll drive up there, and it's all going to be charred black. The beautiful mountains we just saw a few weeks ago, just all charred black. And I thought about that. They said uh, they hadn't had a fire like this in Tennessee for over 100 years, but we did this week. And then I got a call this morning from Randy Scallions, and immediately I called his dad. Brother Jack, I suppose, is he's in his early 70s anyway, and he's getting ready to retire. He's got a guy, I think, that he's grooming to take the place. And I don't know how long he's been there, 35, 40 years. I saw all that stuff built, all those buildings built. And he said, Mike, it's all gone. It's all gone. And I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to rebuild. And by the way, he will. I believe he will if his body will let him. But how would you like to see your life's work completely destroyed? I, I thought about that. I thought about just the trials and the problems that people have right here in our own church. And you, don't, you, you can't shake it off. Somebody says, well, just hang in there. We all say, hang in there, you know. And those are all good words, but how do you? And I want to talk about that. David wrote Psalm 27. And though in his late years he was a very successful king in his early years, I bet he has a very stressful, stressful time. Uh, things were pretty good until one day he was tapped for service. and He was just a young man then. Some believe 
a teenager. I don't know exactly, but during the times that he he took care of his uh, father's flocks, one time a bear came in, so he had to fight a bear. I, I never fought a bear. Don't plan on fighting a bear. Um, he had to fight a bear, and then one time he got caught out in the woods without his sling and had to fight a lion with his bare hands. That's all in the Scripture. And uh, I thought about how hard that would have been. Then he faced off with that giant 10 foot tall. You'd think that, that uh, he was a national hero now and, and uh, you, you kill the giant that was defying the armies of Israel, you'd be a national hero and everybody would love you. Well, they did. I mean, some, some said that David has slain his, Saul has slain his thousands and David has slain his 10,000s. Boy, they were dancing and singing and they were happy about that, but, but Saul wasn't happy about it. And Saul got jealous and uh, things just got worse for him. One, Saul wanted to kill him there uh, two times, maybe three times, I forget. He uh, threw a javelin at him, threw a spear at him. One time he hit the wall, David got out of the way, hit the wall. That would have happened one time for me, and I'd never, it never happened again, that's for sure. But, uh, but yet David had to deal with that, and for six long years he was on the run as a fugitive from his own country that he tried to deliver from the enemy chased like a dog, moving from hiding place to hiding place. And later, when he took the throne, uh, he uh, did something awful, and they had a little baby die. And uh, then he was, because of all that, he had a wicked, wicked uh, son who did, did some terrible incestual things to one of his daughters and warped her mentally. She never came out of the house anymore. Couldn't be around people. Awful, awful home life. Made one of the other's br brothers mad. And he rose up and killed that brother, murdered one of his, David's sons. And then uh, he had another rebel son, Absalom, that took, stole the kingdom from him. And he, he had to leave in the middle of the night running. Someone says, I wish I could be a king like David. <laughs> no, sir, not me. I'll tell you what, I've never had trouble like that. I mean, the guy had problems. And I suppose that many times he wanted to quit. There was one time he came pretty close. I do think his strategy with the Philistine king there was to get away from Saul. He crossed over enemy's lines, and for a while he lived with the Philistines and fought with the Philistines, and I think he had some strategy with that. But nevertheless, he had to act like a crazy man to get away from him. And so I'm just saying that, that uh, you know, his one, one time they burned all the, all the city down with all of his family in it, and they were on the run, and... But, you know, I think there's every time that he probably thought about fainting and giving up. And I know you've been there. Everybody comes pretty close to saying, what in the world? Is it really worth it? All the hard times that I have. But every time he got there, every time he got there, something stopped him. I want to show you what I think that was. Look at verse number 4 again, verse 4. The Bible says, one thing have I desired, one thing, one thing. He said, no, there's a, I got one thing I've asked of the Lord to always let me do, one thing, one thing. Here it is, that I've desired of the Lord, that, I will, that will I seek after. And by the way, he asked God to give him this, and then he chased after what I'm getting ready to show you his whole life. This is one thing he wanted. Here it was, here it is, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Here's what he said. David made a commitment. He made a commitment, and that is this. I'll be faithful to God's house all the days of my life. If I'm not faithful, it's because God stopped me some way, and God would never stop him in that, but he just, I made up my mind, I'm going to be faithful to God's house all the days of my life. I was witnessing to a man today, and and he was talking to me. He said, you know, I don't, people look at me differently when I come into church. And, and he said, I just think we can have church right here. And he said, there's, and there's three of us standing here talking. We were talking to him about the Lord. He said, it's just church right here. And I was trying to, to win him, and I didn't want to be critical. But no, that wasn't church. Church is a gathering of people. We call it out assembly, a congregation. And nevertheless, that's neither here nor there. It's just just David said, I, I'm not going to make, have the church of the rock somewhere out in the shepherd field. or whatever. He said, I, I want to go to the house of the Lord. I'm making that commitment. Then he said this, I want to worship there, and I want to be taught there. Those three things. He makes this commitment to God. 
He says, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord all days of my life. He said, I want to worship there. I want to behold the beauty of the Lord. And then he said this, I want to inquire in his temple. Now, wait a minute. I'll get this later. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. But usually when somebody hits a hard time, the first thing that goes is their church life. David said, not me. And we'll show you why, that, why he, he made that commitment here in just a while. But uh, he said, I, I'm, I'm making the commitment. He said, I'm going to worship there. And let me just stop and say this. Now, I'm not preaching on worship tonight, but he, he describes it like this. He, he describes it, he says, to behold the beauty of the Lord. Now listen, when you come to church on Sunday morning or any time tonight, I just enjoy hearing Brother Pearson sing that song just a moment ago. My Redeemer is faithful and true. That spoke to my heart. But to hear this orchestra and this choir on Sunday mornings to pick up the hymn book and sing praises to God and to let God speak to our hearts whenever we're sitting there in the, in the seat and the preacher's preaching, whether it's me or whoever it is, and the Holy Spirit of God's back there saying, yeah, 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 right there, right there. Yeah, God, God can do that. God can do that. And just behold his beauty every now and then and his power and his might. Then he said this. He said, and he said, uh, and to inquire in his temple. In other words, I want to be taught there. I want to ask things there. I want to learn there. So David said, now mark it down. He says, when I die, I'll still be faithful just like I was when I was young. I'll still be faithful to God, still be faithful to the house of God. But you say, yeah, David, David, but what about hard times? He's, don't, he said, don't matter if I have hard times or not. Hard times didn't make me start going to God's house, and hard times won't stop me from going to God's house. David said, I go to behold his beauty. I go to inquire to, to, or to hear from God. And I go because God is good. And so uh, verse 4, he makes a commitment. And then he talks about all of his trouble. We get down to verse 13 and we see his humanity in verse 13. Look at that if you would. Verse 13, he says, I had fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the hand of the living. And so we see his humanity coming out here. He says, I would have quit. Most people would have quit. They were in my shoes. But he said, I believed in something. And he said, I believe this, that God is good. Would you say with me together, God is good. Say it again, God. He said, I, I, I just know I'm going to see the goodness of God. God is good. Uh, Brother Bishop teaches us that. His whole ministry is surrounding that. And in heaven... And all the perfection there. But he is also saying this, that God is good right now in the land of the living. Fires are sweeping through the Smoky Mountains and, and destruction just south of us in the Chattanooga region. And, and there's all, all types of heartaches here tonight. And I understand that there would be no way that I would know the load that some of you carry. But God's not just good when we get to heaven. God is good in the land of the living right now. Somebody say amen. Right now. Right now. Psalm, uh, excuse me, Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now, here's the principle I want to give you that kept David from fainting. Once you write this down, a little formula, and then I want to give you just a few words of application. Write this down. By the way, let me, can I challenge you to memorize this? Because when you get, when you get hit from Satan and something bad comes, you don't get to pick when that is. And you don't get to Get your spiritual guns loaded before he comes along. It'll come out of nowhere. And so you're going to have to have some resolute about you to where your, your mind will begin to immediately gravitate some things that you know is true. Write this first one down. It's very, very simple. Write this first one down. God is good. God is good. I'm going to give you a formula. God is good. That's the standard. He is the standard of good. Uh, Matthew uh, 18, 18, 17, there is none good but one that is God. Uh, Psalm 25, 8, uh, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, will, uh, he teach sinners his way. So number one, God is good. Now, I know, I know what you're, some of you are thinking. Yeah, I know he's good, but sometimes we think he's good. Sometimes not all the time. God's good all the time. Number one, God is good. Number two, that means, number two, God does good. If God is good, then God does good. The things that God does is good. Everything God, God does is good. Psalm 119, verse 68, thou art good, thou doest good. He is, a, he is a good God. God made everything, the Bible says in Genesis 131, 
and God saw that everything that he made, behold, it was very good. So there was a time uh, that, that everything God made was very good, and sin entered in. And so you've got to always keep in mind the theology behind this. That which is bad is because of sin entering in. My body right now and, and the things going on in my life and with my health and all that and your health, everybody's health, we, Adam didn't have any of that until he sinned. He was a mean, lean fighting machine, same way with Eve. But sin entered in, and so now we all got that to deal with. That's not God's fault. That's our fault. I guess he could just wipe the first two people he had. He made off the face of the earth and just forgot it and start over. But he took that, and by grace, he redeemed them, and then he gave them his will to work through their problems. And man's been doing that for over 6,000 years. And so uh, God is good. God does good. David made up his mind about this. It was settled. God is good, and God does good. Uh, hard times come. David said, God is still good. Uh, your, your baby died, David. God is still good. And you, you ought to go back and read what he said when all that happened. I mean, he prayed and begged God, wept and fasted and was laid in sackcloth and ashes. And then uh, when the baby is sick and then they came in, they, they were afraid to say anything to the king. He said, look what he's done. The baby's just sick. What are we going to, what, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What's he going to do to himself now if we tell him the baby's dead? And uh, they went in and told him. He straightened up, washed himself, put on clean clothes. They set food down in front of him for the first time in days. And they said, we don't understand. He dried his eyes. He said, that baby ain't coming back. But I'm going to go where that baby's at. What was he saying? God is good. And God does good. Number three, write this one down. God allowed this. God allowed this. Now, it may be our fault. It may be the devil's fault. It may be just the flesh and nature and all that. But I promise you, God knows about it. And I, I will say this over and over. And by the way, I know I'm repeating myself when I say it. So don't see all sit back there and say, hey, the old boy's been here so many years, keeps repeating the same thing. No, I'm going to repeat this until you all finally figure it out. Read the book of Job. All the bad things that happened to Job happened because Satan came to him and said, yeah, I'd serve you too if you, if you gave me everything you gave him. And... Uh, God lifted the hedge. He said, you get that hedge from around him. He said, I'll get at him. He said, he'll curse you to your face. God knew. God knew. He lifted that hedge. Satan comes swooping in. Killed all of his kids in the tornado. Took away all of his cattle, all of his, all of his livestock. Business. Smote his body with boils. Job said, what? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? And all this, Job sinned not with his lips. I'm just saying, God allowed it. God allowed it. And number four, this is where we roll through this thing. Number four, God knows what is best for me. God knows what is best for me. If God is good and God does good, then whatever I'm going through had to be approved by God before it ever got to me. You say, why? Because God always does what's right. And that's exactly the conclusion that Job arrived at in chapter 2 and verse 10. Let's repeat these together, if you would, because I'll make sure that you get it. Number one, God is good. Say it with me. Number one. Number two, God does good. Number three. God allowed this. Number four, God knows what is best for me. Let's say it again. Number one, God is what? Number two? Number three? Number four? No, we serve a great God. I, I, don't, I don't want you to become robotic in that. Either we believe it or we don't believe it. And if you don't believe it, then I don't know what's getting you through life. And I don't know what's coming your way. And I don't wish anything bad on anybody. But God is good. And God does good. And God allowed this. And God knows what is best for me. God never makes a mistake. Man's problems. 
sometimes we think we're smarter than God, but God never makes a mistake, and our track record is full of fault. His track record is perfect. Psalm 1830, as for God, his way is perfect. You say, all right, preacher, how's this going to help me when I'm tempted to faint, when I'm tempted to give up? Let me give you four things by way of application, and then I'm finished. Number one, decide the character issue of God early. That's what David did in his youth. Decide the character issue of God early. David did this. He believed that God was good. He believed that God does good. He believed that the things that was happening, God allowed it. You go back and read when he was going around and around and around the mulberry bush with Saul chasing him all the time. And listen to him as he meditates and talks to the Lord. He said, well, Lord, if I do this, uh, will you be there? And da, da, da. And he, was, he knew that God was in complete control of that whole mess. Or he'd have jumped off the bandwagon a long time ago. He was already anointed to be the king. And so uh, decide the character issue of God. He, he made up his mind. Now the, the, the trouble with people today is that many think that God is good in some things, but not all things. Or God's, God's good sometimes, but not when it happens to me. I was listening to a man uh, who lost everything up in, up in uh, Gatlinburg. And he was saying this on the camera just the other night. He said, I tell you, he said, I watched those wildfires out in California for years. He said, I, I never thought we'd ever have it here. He said, it's different here. Now, he wasn't indicting God or anything, but I'm just saying, we think it can never happen. And so we need to understand that we, we, we can't be blaming God because James says God can tempt no man with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Number two, when trouble comes, focus on God and not on what God has allowed. When trouble comes, focus on God and not what God has allowed. This is very important. This is how you avoid bitterness. Mark it down. A real saint of God draws closer to God during the storm. Weak Christians, those weak in their faith, tend to faint. They tend to give up. They tend to get bitter. But uh, when the storm comes, is no time to run from God. I remember when Joel was little. And those old storm clouds would clack, clap together and the lightning would bolt down. But he would run. He'd run right to Daddy. That's the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to run closer to God when the storm clouds come. And when troubles come, we've got to intensify our prayers, intensify our Bible study, and uh, uh, for goodness sake, stay in church. That's the last thing you want to skip out on. David made his commitment about that. By the way, there's nothing wrong with questioning God as long as you always end up in the right place and you don't get to arguing with God. You always need to come back to the right same place that God is good, and God does good, and God allowed this. And God knows what's best for me. Number three, always flee back to God is good. Always flee back to the formula. When doubts come, remember the fact, and always remember that you have made a commitment to this fact. And if you've never done that, let me challenge you to do it right now. If you've, never, if you've never said, for the rest of my life, I'm going to find myself in the house of God, praising God, and learning about God, I'm not going to let anything drive me away from God because I believe I'll see the goodness of God. You won't see it if you quit. You're not going to see it if you faint and give up. But you need to always flee back to the formula, God is good and God does good and God knows what's best and so forth. And the principle about this is God will guide your life. It's guided my life up to this point. Look, the moment that you convince yourself that God made a mistake, therefore God is not good, is the moment you begin to faint. You say, I'd never do that. I know a lot of good people that do. So I'm challenging you to make a commitment about this. And then number four, when you don't understand, wait on God. When you don't understand, wait on God. He will strengthen you. My wife and I, for all these years of marriage, I, as a fellow over to house working the other day, I told him how many years we've been married. He stopped and went, oh, I didn't even tell you that. He went, really? And I, How long have you been married, Brother Bush? Show? 69 years. 
We're going to root for 70. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. But we've been doing this for years, and that is that when we don't know what to do, we wait. Throw the brakes on. You say, how long you wait? We wait until God tells us to stop waiting. And we move. Look what he says, the last verse right here, and I'm finished, last verse. Uh, 27, uh, 14. Look at verse 13. He said, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. They call this a double command, and that is he's telling us, be patient, be patient. Be patient. You know something how you got you to gotta repeat that some, sometimes with somebody who's impatient? Little Braxton, little my grandson, don't have a clue what patience is. It's paw, 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 just a minute. Paw, 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 paw. I say, be patient, son. I, I just see him one of these days, he's going to throw up his hands and say, I don't know what that is, Paw, Paw. Yeah, tell me about that. But whenever you're trying to get somebody to settle down and be patient, you repeat yourself. And that's what God's doing. Wait, wait, just wait. I like the verse in Isaiah 40, verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up the wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And God is saying this. Whenever troubles come, God is good. God does good. God allowed this, and God knows what's best for me. And while we're working through this thing, just wait. Just wait. And God will strengthen you. Story of Job. I don't know how long it is he waited through all that sickness and all that trouble. But at the end of the book, God gave him double of everything. God strengthened him. I'm looking at the faces of people that you waited through a sorrow and a hard time. It took a while. But God strengthened you. He strengthened me, and he's going to strengthen all of us. I'm just saying God doesn't want us to faint or give up. He's given us everything in the world to help us to hang in there. When I was a little boy growing up, we, uh, we went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I, I tell you this all the time. just want you to know this is my life. I enjoy so much what I do being a pastor, but I just enjoy coming to church. I was slapped tired tonight. And uh, just two or three just extremely busy days, but I couldn't wait to get the house of God. I know some preachers have probably just let someone else preach and for them, and I just I was want to come in and tell you all how not to faint tonight. That's what's on my heart. But, but that's how I, I was raised. And uh, I remember when I was uh, always like coming to church when I was little, and then I got older and could play outside on Sunday afternoon or Sunday night or Wednesday, come home from school, put my play clothes on, go down and play ball, football, sandlot baseball, play army, cowboys and Indians, Arabs and Jews, whatever. <laughs> and we, uh, that's what they have now. But, but uh, we, we, we play hard. We play hard. And I remember mom or dad coming on the back porch saying, Michael, Joey, Timmy, Angie and Amy weren't born yet. And then these words that came was bone chilling. It's time to get clean up for church. And you say, why was that bone chilling? Because nobody else on our street went to church at night. I mean, they went and had whatever early mass was or whatever. But at nighttime, the Norse boys went. And I got to thinking, this is a bummer. Everybody else, I mean, they say they're going to heaven. They don't have to go to church on Sunday night, Wednesday night. I wallowed around that for a while. My dad had a way of knocking that out of me. <laughs> but they were teaching me then what David knew early in life. And he said this, Nothing will ever drive me away from the house of God. No matter what happens to me, I'm going to be there, I'm going to praise God, and I'm going to learn about God. And by the way, to our knowledge... Nothing drove him away from the house of God. A formula for not fainting. This is the place. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray you'll challenge us, Lord, in the days ahead. And um, I think of some of the dear people that are struggling. 
we named them this morning as we prayed. And um, we just ask you, Lord, to let their dilemmas come to an end in a delightful way and help them to be patient and wait on you and strengthen them. Keep us close to you and keep us to the house, in, in the house of God, a play, the place of praise, the pray, place to learn of thee and draw us close, we pray we, these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. And I don't know what you're going through tonight, but maybe you just want to tiptoe this altar and just say, God, help me. Help me to wait on you. Help me to be patient. Help me, to, help me just to do the right thing. This altar is open right now. If you want to come, slip up here and pray. Maybe there's something there you want to pray in your seat. That'd be fine. Let's let God work in our lives tonight. Some of the people you know are having some deep water right now. If you want to pray for them, let's take the time to do it. Maybe just we need to make the commitment tonight to say God is good and God does good. God allowed this and God knows what's best. We just make that our formula for not fainting, not giving up on God. Hard times are going to come. Nobody can take it away. Let's let the Lord work tonight. If you're not sure that heaven's your home, you're in a wonderful place to come to Christ. We'll have somebody standing on the end of each aisle with a Bible in their hand. They'd love to take that Bible tonight and show you how you could become a born-again Christian. We want you to come. We want you to come. Father, bless this time. And I pray you'll just teach us, Lord, these principles, these truths, and help us to address the character issue of you first. You're always good. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're singing right now. Just leave your seat and come as we sing, would you? Day by day and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I have no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. Thank you. May be seated. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Challenge us, Lord, please, with these truths of commitment. May we be reminded that you're in control and you love us with an everlasting love. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Look this way. Appreciate your attention so much tonight. It's good to have Tanner Mosley. Tanner, could you stand up there? Talk to Tanner earlier. And you've been saved. You want to be baptized. Is that right?